if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, which some people have, narcissism seems to be really good for short-term mating success. If I go to a bar in downtown Austin and I give narcissism questionnaires to all the dudes there, the higher scores are going to get the most numbers over time. That's usually mm. what happens. So narcissism is usually good for short-term mating and it's good for status seeking, power seeking. Narcissism is a flu that you give to everyone. They feel awful while you feel great. So I wanted to start off by discussing that idea. And it kind of implies that narcissists are happier. Yeah, it's it's an interesting idea because most of the time when we think about health or mental health, we're thinking about a problem that affects the individual primarily. So somebody is anxious, they're, they have anxiety all the time, the, the anxious person is suffering. People around them suffer a little, but not as much. Somebody's depressed, it really hurts, but the people around them, it's not fun being around depressed people, but the depressed person hurt, hurts most. There are these other cases, though, where the people around are the people who suffer. So one example are things like addictions. So alcoholism, you know, at the early stages, if you're, hand, if you're holding it well together pretty well, you can have a decent life as a drinker, but you really damage your wife and kids. Narcissism seems to have some of those same qualities, where if your narcissism is working, you're, you're having some success in life, getting some positive feedback, you're able to feel good about yourself, but at the same time exploit or damage others. So you can be a terrible father, terrible husband, but you can still go, I'm killing it. Look at my performance at work. Look at how well I'm doing. Look how attractive I am. Look at my spouse and, and kids. They don't really, they still think I'm awesome. So you're able to have this, this disorder where the primary victims, or I should say victims, the primary sufferers are people in the close relationship with you. And that's a little different than most disorders. And that would, what's makes, what makes it harder to treat in a way is you go to somebody who's really narcissistic, who is not having a lot of problems himself or herself. You go, you need to change. And the person says, well, I don't really need to change. I feel pretty good. In fact, I feel I'm kind of better than everybody else. It makes it hard to change. Your question about do narcissists feel good uh, when we're talking about grandiose narcissism as a personality trait, so this is the narcissism that has more energy, more charisma, more extroversion, that form of narcissism, people who have it generally f have high self-esteem and have more positive emotion, more positive affect. That's a fancy way of saying they're happier. So there does seem to be some benefit, at least in terms of self-esteem and happiness, to being a little bit narcissistic. And the costs are often more interpersonal. I assume a narcissist wouldn't reach out for help. They wouldn't purchase a book or go see a therapist because if I'm anxious, it's affecting me every day. If I'm depressed, it's affecting me every day. I will invest my time in purchasing a book, listening to a podcast like this, going to see a therapist. If I am a narcissist, it would be almost impossible in many ways to say I need to get help. Is that correct? It's a real challenge. It's a real challenge to get people who are narcissistic to say they need help. And I should, there is a more vulnerable form of narcissism where you have a lot of depression that goes with it. And that form, you do seem more likely to seek therapy. But with the kind of what most grandiose forms, it's hard to get people in therapy. Sometimes they get in there for relational problems or for addiction. So that's sometimes a way in. Um, the other thing that's a challenge that you don't think about or people don't necessarily think about is even in therapy, the dropout rates with narcissism are much higher. So you're getting people in therapy and, you know, imagine I'm in therapy and they start saying, Keith, you know, you're, you know, you think you're a 10, you're really more of an eight. That's pretty good. Eight's pretty good. And you're like, you know, I don't need to hear this. I, I've got these friends and they tell me I'm a 10 all the time. I'm going to hang out with my friends. So there's some resistance to therapy. But to make it more complicated, if people are narcissistic, and this is when it becomes more of a disorder, and they're successfully able to complete therapy, they seem to be able to change. So there's the potential for change with narcissism. The challenge is having people identify it's a problem and then get into some sort of a treatment, therapy, something to change and stick with it. You mentioned 
different types of narcissism. This is the first time I've heard that there are different types. So it feels important to maybe uh, zoom out and talk about the different versions of narcissism. Yeah, so this is, is kind of why I call the book The New Science. I mean, one of the big things we've discovered in the research literature is there are two uh, general personality styles or personality trait styles that we describe as narcissism. And the one that we're most familiar with and most people will think about is this combination of sort of a sense of entitlement and a need for admiration, coupled with a drive for power, a drive for achievement, maybe some charisma. So this is what you see with the narcissistic leaders, the narcissistic celebrities, the narcissistic people you end up in bad relationships with, your former horrible boss, who... So it's this combination of drive and... and what makes that grandiose narcissism work is there's a lot of drive and ambition. So people that are really confident and driven and, and self-satisfied, and they do pretty well. This other form of narcissism, which we're not as familiar with, if we're not therapists and we're not clinicians, is called vulnerable narcissism. So this has the same sense of entitlement, the same I'm better than other people, but instead of that extroversion and drive like, you know, Tony Stark and Iron Man, you're, you're a little bit neurotic, you're insecure, you don't think people respect you, and you're, you know, maybe a little introverted. So sometimes this more vulnerable form is called covert narcissism because it's hard to see. Sometimes it's called shy narcissism because it's kind of quiet. Sometimes it's called basement narcissism because it's, you know, like you're living in your mom's basement, you know, yelling at the world for not paying attention to you. People, so if you're ambitious and you're willing to go do stuff, that's, that works out okay. It just leads to problems. If you're ambitious and you're not willing to do things because you're kind of neurotic and vulnerable, that leads to this more, that leads people to end up with a lot of depression, anxiety, and they end up in therapy for it. So people are more vulnerably narcissistic end up in therapy. And sometimes, well, it can come to the surface. And I'm assume almost like everything, there's a spectrum, right? Because does somebody with like a really high self-esteem and high confidence, is there like a fine line and then it becomes narcissism? Is there a spectrum or is that the wrong way to look at it? Um, it's, it's both right and wrong. So it, there is certainly a narcissism spectrum. I mean, I think about narcissism as primarily personality trait, meaning most of us are somewhere in the middle. Some people are high, some people are low. There's a very small percentage of people who are very high in narcissism who have some other real problems, and that can be diagnosed as a clinical disorder, which is narcissistic personality disorder, which people confuse with sort of narcissism. But that's the very extreme end would be the disorder. But within that spectrum, self-esteem is a little different. Self-esteem tends to correlate with narcissism. So people who are narcissistic also like themselves. I mean, I should say the way we define self-esteem is having a positive attitude about yourself. So self-esteem is like, I, I like Mercedes. I like, you know, I like Hawks and I like myself. So self-esteem is really just your simple attitude about yourself. People who are narcissistic have high self-esteem, but it's not the same thing. They go together, but you can have very high self-esteem. Like, yeah, I'm a good person. I'm equal to other people. I'm satisfied with who I am. I really like who I am. That doesn't make you a toxic person. Saying, you know, I really like to look at myself in the mirror. I'm better than other people. If I ruled the world, there'd be a much better place. I wish someone would write my biography. That's narcissism, and that's where you get more social problems because, you know, these people want to dominate and have people take their picture when they're dominating others. I guess... My curiosity would go to the origin of this. Is this something that's genetic? Is this your childhood experiences? Is, is this the way you were kind of brought up? Is there an element of genetics that you found? Absolutely. Um, what we find, and this isn't just narcissism, this is kind of all personality. What you find is there's a good chunk, about 50%, maybe more, maybe up to 60, but definitely 50% that seems to be heritable, probably genetics. There's no gene. I mean, there's no, there's no single gene for any of these things. It's a combination of genes working together in ways we don't understand. I want to be clear about that. If anyone tries to sell you narcissism genetic test, it doesn't exist. But these things are really heritable, about 50%. About 10% to 20% is is can be linked to parenting. 
So when you look at, you know, what your parents do, it's a very small percentage. As parents, you know, we think we have all this power shaping our kids' personality. We really don't. We can we can work on the margins, but the personality is really kind of what we do genetically. What you find with narcissism is they say, well, my parents were a little permissive. They put me on a pedestal. They said I was a special child. So there is this idea that there's some grandiosity that maybe in childhood that maybe goes with narcissism. But again, it's not the biggest piece. And then about, you know, that other 30, 40 percent is what we call non-shared environment. It's just random stuff. You grow up, my kid grows up and she starts hanging out with the YouTube crew, you know, at age 14. And maybe her narcissism gets turned on because she wants to be a performer and be famous. And my other kid joins the I don't know, rugby team, and she wants to be narcissistic, but she keeps getting punched in the head, and so she can't be narcissistic. She comes more humble. So, you know, that kind of environmental factors will shape it. This is probably almost like a personal question, but as an expert, someone that's written books and have been talking about this for a really long time, it almost seems like a kid could have lost the genetic lottery, made a couple choices in middle school to hang out with the right crowd, wrong, wrong crowd in this case. Do you almost have empathy? Because the word narcissism is almost like the word psychopath. These people are bad. They should be shunned. Stay away. Um, but it kind of sounds like a kid could have got almost unlucky to become a narcissist. So do you have almost empathy for a lot of people oh, dealing with this? Absolutely. I mean, I've I've been studying narcissism for 30 years and I see it I really see it as a trade-off. And I see this with all persons, including psychopathy. I mean, there's a benefit to psychopathy. I, I can tell you about discussions I've had with surgeons about it. There's so narcissism is really a trade-off. It can be beneficial in certain areas of life. It's beneficial in getting dates, it's beneficial in public performance, it's beneficial in becoming a leader. So it has these positive outcomes. It also has negative consequences. It can damage close and loving relationships. It can make you an unethical leader. Um, It can harm you in other ways. 